<laughs> uh, my name is Allie Osworth. Uh, I'm the geekery editor at Autostraddle, uh, which is not porn. Uh, it's a website by and for queer women. Um, I'm writing a novel about Gamergate. I'm also an adjunct professor at the New School teaching digital storytelling and the managing editor at Barnard's Scholar and Feminist Online. I spend all of my professional life thinking about cyberspace, meat space, and how the two intersect. Today I'm here to talk about two ways in which we bring the body into cyberspace, specifically the queer body, and how we use that body to tell queer stories. This talk is going to be split into two parts, web comics and how we're currently doing things versus virtual reality and how we have the opportunity to do things. Uh, the world of explicitly queer webcomics is vast, with creator-owned and operated titles from Erica Moen, uh, creator of Dar and Ojoy oh Sex Toy, uh, A. Stifler and Kay Copeland, the queer couple behind Chaos Life, and Kylie Wu of Trans Girl Next Door. Autostraddle has taken advantage of this digital extension of queer zine culture with regular comics from Cameron Glavin who digitizes her body with no neck. Uh, Anna Archie Bongiovanni, who writes about the fictional Grease Bats. Megan Prezanica, uh, who writes a journal comic about her life in LA with some whimsical fictional twists to it, like the character Caro vomiting up Huffington Post headlines after binging political think pieces. <laughs> And Yao Zhao, um, who I, I like to say that she does uh, something called poics cometry, uh, co poetry comics. Queers have always had a hand in comics. This is nothing new. But the digitization of comics has created the perfect medium for telling queer stories. There are a few reasons for that. First, the ease of forming queer spaces and communities online. The overhead for hosting such a space is comparatively low, lower than, say, the rent on a lesbian bar, and the consequences of failure are less dire. The ability to congregate online also connects us despite the large spaces between us. Because queer people make up only 3.5% of the adult population in the US, the community is often spread apart, especially for queers living in rural areas. The miles between us make meeting online where your community is never farther away than your smartphone extremely convenient. In places where one can be persecuted based on queerness, the cyberspace option is also safer. Even as corporations attempt to squash our spaces as what happened to After Ellen, <laughs> uh, we still thrive here on Autostraddle, Tumblr, and yes, in comics. Second, there's what our brains actually do while reading comics, web or otherwise. Comics are fundamentally juxtapositional. We, the readers, are shown a series of images and words in sequence. We might not notice it at the time, but there are large spaces between frames, and I'm not talking about physical space. Take this series of images, and forgive me, I edit comics, I don't make them, and I drew these. <laughs> um, we begin with the egg on the left. The next image shows a crack in the egg. Our eyes don't see the crack forming, but our brains make the leap through that liminal space in between. We understand the egg is hatching, and we have an expectation of what will come next. This juxtaposition, the leaps our cognition makes into liminal space, prime our consciousness for a queer story. Queer identity often does not fit neatly into a binary. Sometimes it doesn't even fit nicely on a spectrum. Rather, it sits in the gray areas between more mainstream presentations, genders, and sexual orientations. Our brains, by making the leaps to understand images in sequence, are already making the leaps necessary to understand an identity that doesn't necessarily look like our own. What we have in webcomics that tell queer stories is an inextricable intertwining of form and content, a perfect medium in which to express a queer story. That story almost always includes a body. Whether that body is fictional, as with Bon Giovanni's Grease Bats in this comic about Magic Mike XXL, uh, or autobiographical, the artist chooses how to present a queer body online. 
They draw the body, emphasizing aspects they wish the reader to see. In the case of an autobiographical body like Glavin's, uh, the aspects the artist chooses to emphasize are independent of photorealism. There is a tremendous amount of agency in choosing and drawing a body. And the reader not only has the opportunity to see the artist reflected, but quite possibly themselves. This extremely intimate portrait of a queer body is birthed into cyberspace for consumption by the other. Even if the reader is queer, they are almost always an other. Web comics are necessarily presented through a third person limited point of view, where the artist is free to pan the camera of the reader's eye. Because we sit outside the comic, we feel omniscient. Like we're getting the whole story, even as our brains are constantly piecing together the puzzle of the comic, even though there are actually gaps in our information. In short, we feel we understand this queer story because of the way the body functions in space and our relationship to it and how we are functioning as a necessity of the art form. It is this relationship between body and point of view that links webcomics and virtual reality. Both do very interesting things with how we move the body through space. But VR has the opportunity to be a more powerful tool for queer storytellers by exploiting what our brains and bodies do while under the headset. The first thing I experienced on the HTC Vive, like many others, I'm sure, was the eight-minute portal aperture robot repair demonstration. I was unprepared for the bodily experience I had. For one, bodies on a screen when you're reading a webcomic are just that, screen-sized, miniature. My body reacted with fear when I encountered my first robot. It was the size of a pony. Suddenly, I was very aware of the space my body took up in this virtual world. I became even more aware when the snarky house-sized robot showed up to shit-talk me. When the floor dropped out and the ceiling fell, my body panicked of its own accord, even though I found the dialogue to be quite humorous. My body didn't know the difference between real ceiling and virtual ceiling, between non-existent computer robot and three-story murder bot. No longer was the point of view third person, as it is with comics, nor was it a facsimile of first person, as with many video games. I'd argue that virtual reality is the closest thing we've ever had to a true second person point of view, which is even more powerful, because no longer are we experiencing the body from an outside perspective, no longer are we riding inside the mind of an other protagonist. Now, the protagonist is you, your body, your body in a digital world. There is tremendous power and agency in bringing a body into cyberspace. While webcomics is the current post most perfect medium to bring a queer body into digital space, it is this second person point of view, this bodily transference, that will make virtual reality the next perfect medium for queer creators. Once again, our brains are doing exactly the kind of work needed to process an identity that doesn't look like our own, just by engaging with the art form. This time, however, it's engaging less with our academic people brain and more with our lizard brain. The way we're parsing the story has less to do with cognition and more to do with reaction. We still feel like we're getting the whole story because we are experiencing it, even though our bodies sometimes feel small and limited by our place in the world, rather than freed by our place outside it. All the gaps are filled in for us, but our brains are still doing the work of sorting out juxtaposition. This time, though, it is the juxtaposition of expected reality and imagined reality. This is a deeper, more personal perspective. Imagine the power of bringing a straight, white, cis, able body into digital space and through a narrative that assumes queerness, treating that body like a queer women's. Imagine being a, pl a queer player and finally embodying a protagonist so deeply in a game or art piece that assumes queerness and feeling seen in a way that we have literally never had the opportunity to before. And how rad would it be to bring a queer body into a narrative that assumes, and I will put this in some heavy, heavy, heavy air quotes, a default identity. We can queer narratives just by putting our bodies in them. The argument for inclusion of queers in developing our brand new reality isn't a diversity one, though I think that argument should be enough. It is rather a storytelling one. We're already primed for it. 
I predict that queer communities can and will thrive in virtual reality settings for the same reasons they currently thrive online. I predict that queers will seek out these even more personal representations of our bodies moving through cyberspace as we already have done in webcomics. I predict queer storytellers will not prioritize tech before stories or stories before tech, but will find the stories that can only be told in this new medium as we always have done. However, I'm not seeing the artistic boom I'd hope to see. For one, cyberspace was never designed for us. We've already seen the results of an entire facet of our reality being designed by and for only a small subset of its end user demographic. Online harassment continues to be a massive problem for any marginalized community, one that's already bleeding into our brand new virtual reality. Take this piece on Medium by Jordan Bellamere, in which a female player, gendered only by her voice, reports being virtually groped and running through a game in order to escape, to escape her assailant. Here are a few expert, uh, excerpts from her piece. Um, to complete the reality of my experience, my brother-in-law directed me to the top of the highest tower in the game. Now walk off the ledge, he suggested. Might as well try. I inched closer and closer to the edge, looking out onto a very convincing 100-foot drop. My fear of heights started kicking in, strong. Closing my eyes, I took a single step off the ledge, and nothing happened. I didn't fall, and I was walking on air. I was a god. This is the same kind of really powerful bodily experience that I had. Uh, but then, of course, the digital groping happens, and Remember that little digression I told you about? How the 100 foot drop looked so convincing? Yeah, guess what? The virtual groping feels just as real. Of course, you're not physically being touched, just like you're not actually 100 feet off the ground, but it's still scary as hell. There is a tremendous power to bring a body into cyberspace, but there is also an inherent risk, especially if your body is considered a marginalized one. Aaron Stanton and Jonathan Shanker, the developers of Quiver, responded in a piece on Upload VR. Here's a quote from that. The first thing I felt was that we had let someone down. We should have prevented this in the first place. While Quiver, that's the name of the game, uh, is still in pre-release alpha, we'd already programmed a setting into the game called your personal bubble. So other players' hands disappear if they come close to your face. This way, the rare bad apple player can't block someone else's view and be annoying. The arrows that get shot at you stick in your helmet, which is good for a laugh, but they do no damage and quickly disappear so they don't get in the way. We hadn't, though, thought of extending that fading function to the rest of the body. We'd thought only of the possibility of some silly person trying to block your view with their hands and ruining the game. How could we have overlooked something so obvious? The makers of Quiver responded to this digital groping swiftly and, in my opinion, in a really excellent way, with a gesture that returns power to those being harassed and that doesn't take you out of the game. With two trigger pulls and an expansive hand motion, you fade from your assailant's point of view and they disappear from yours. But they admitted themselves that it wasn't something they considered before releasing the game. And yet this kind of stuff is all I think about. It was in the very first draft of my novel that I wrote. It is obvious to some of us. We are already starting to repeat our mistakes by excluding marginalized communities from development, but I'm hopeful that it's early enough that it's not too late. I see a few concrete solutions. And here I will speak only from the point of view of a queer woman. The needs of other marginalized communities might be very different from my own. First, the barrier to entry for VR in comparison to, say, web comics, where you just need a pen, a paper, and a scanner, is very high. Add up the cost of not only VR equipment, but the time and energy it takes to learn to code, to learn Unity, to put together a team with little to no financial backing. Thinking this way may paint a clearer picture of who is economically able to purchase and play with the latest toys. Companies are already trying to lower the cost of the hardware. But lowering the cost of knowledge is also key. 
Hiring queers into technology positions and allowing an amount of learning on the job will help decrease the cost of that knowledge. The industry needs to stop devaluing soft skills. Skills like realizing a large percentage of your user base is likely to be harassed in your VR game. That's not a soft skill. Collaborate with your favorite queer storytellers. We're everywhere. And often, due to all sorts of systemic stuff, we feel like we need to know everything about a project before we begin to play. So don't be shy. Approach us first. But don't exploit our narratives. Treat us like partners, not like props. We as consumers, all of us, need to directly fund independent queer artists as they tackle virtual reality projects, and we need to allow them to learn on the job too. And we all need to come up with the million other ways to provide access to would-be queer creators that I haven't thought of because I'm a writer and not a developer. This is less an academic talk and more a call to action. What can you do to make virtual reality the next big, perfect medium to tell queer stories, to make it accessible to queer creators as we tell our small queer stories to the big, wide virtual world. Thank you. Thank you.